This morning, new video was released of that CRJ crash in Toronto, and it weaves a very interesting story. Some people are saying that the pilot forgot to flare, but it might not be that simple, and the answers might be in the data. So let's get into it. First, let's talk about landings and the art of the flare. Typically, as an airplane approaches the runway to land, it's descending too fast to touch down safely. So as pilots, we're trained to perform a maneuver called a flare, where we pull up at the last second. If we pull up too hard, the nose will go too high and will float down the runway, or we might even start ascending again. But if we don't pull up enough, the plane will keep descending far too fast and slam into the ground. In the video, you can see that the plane doesn't appear to flare, but why might that be? Let's start by looking at the GPS data, and specifically the ground speed of the airplane. Just before landing, the ADSB track shows the plane is doing around 118 knots over the ground. That's below the VREF, or the typical landing speed, for this airplane. If the plane is flying too slow, that would mean the wings have stalled and the pilot might not have even been able to pull up. But the devil is in the details. You might remember from the ATC tapes from yesterday that the winds were strong and gusting. Toronto Tower, Endeavour 4819, Tower, wind 270 gust 33, clear to line on 823, you might get a slight bump in the glide path, there'll be an aircraft in front of it. The winds were gusting 23 to 33, and that ADS-B data is only ground speed, not airspeed. To get a more accurate view of the airspeed and subsequently the speed that the plane would stall at, we need to add that wind component. If we calculate out the crosswind component, that gives us about 20 to 25 knots of headwind, or if we add that to our ground speed, it gives us around 140 knots. That's actually a really good approach speed for the CRJ-900. We can cross-reference this with the granular data that Flight Radar 24 has published this morning. Most flight tracking websites only publish a subset of the data that ADS-B actually broadcasts. That's because to track an airplane, you only need its location and altitude, and that's good enough for most people who just want to see where a plane is. Sending more data than people need to see just costs more bandwidth and hurts website responsiveness. But for these big accidents, Flight Radar 24 also publishes the raw, granular ADS-B data. From this granular data, Data, we can see that ADS-B was publishing the true airspeed of the airplane. In the seconds before the accident, we can see that the plane is flying at 146 knots. This plane was still flying. But one really interesting piece of the data is the plane's vertical speed. The granular data gives us the plane's actual vertical speed and not a calculated vertical speed. We can see that on approach, the plane is descending at around 600 feet per minute. But in the final five seconds, the plane drops out from underneath them and descends at over 1,000 feet per minute. But that then begs the question, were they hit with a sudden downdraft, and what would have caused that? We know that they followed in another plane, a Challenger 650, which is a small private jet. You might get a slight bump in the glide path, there'll be an aircraft in front of it. But the Challenger aircraft aren't known for producing heavy wake turbulence. And the two aircraft had over a minute and a half worth of spacing. With a strong crosswind, that means any wake turbulence most likely would have been completely dissipated. Some people have suggested the plane landed without flaps, but you can definitely see the slats in the video, and sometimes at this angle, the flaps are a little bit more difficult to see. It's going to be most interesting to see what the pilot's control inputs were, and any granular weather information that the Transportation Safety Board can produce. 